This is Adobe Dimension. Adobe Dimension is similar to the online mock-up generators, apart from it's based within software. And obviously because it's based within software, we have a greater array of features. So if we look to the left hand side, you'll see we have our assets. Now the first assets are the models. The models are the literal objects. Here you'll see a square bottle, a round bottle, a coffee cup, a drinks carton, a beverage can, a coffee bag, food pouch, food bag, tube pack, food can, takeout box, tall box, cube box, box with a lid, I think that is, stack of cards, business cards, tied string package, a notepad, gift bag, small jar, twist jar, twist can. We've got cloth on a table. We're going to assign our logo to cloth hanging over a table, draped over. We've got a squeezy tube. We've got a t-shirt, drawstring bag, a beach towel, a pump lid bottle. We've got an LED sign. We've e even got a bus stand. We've got a splash, various splashes, and we've got the tablets and the iPhones as standard. So if we scroll down further, you'll see that we also have primitive shapes, such as a sphere, a cube, a hollow cube, cylinder, a rounded cone, rounded cube, rounded cylinder, cone, hollow cube, prism, capsule, disc, plane, pyramid. So that covers the range. So should we ever require those shapes for whatever reason, that's them there. Those are 3D shapes that we can pull over into the canvas here. So scrolling down, you'll also say we have Adobe standard materials. Okay, and these include glass, matte, plastic, metal, walnut, light oak, cement, leather, brass, gelatin, ice, glitter, beer, water, and olive oil to name but a few. So if we were to have an object on the canvas here, whether it be a literal one like a can or something primitive like a pyramid, we can assign one of these materials to apply to it. Scrolling down, you'll see we have substance materials, and these include glossy, cardboard, cedar, chocolate, ceramic, brushed, silver, felt, smooth, striped, bronze, plastic, 3D printed. So and these are also um, materials that we can apply to these objects here on the the plane or the stage as you might call it. Moving down we have what we call directional lights. Now these are lights that point directly towards the objects and they give like a, a tinge to the, the surface area. Obviously if you light an object it's more lit on one side and it's more shadow on the other. And this is true of the directional lights Though it does depend upon how you position them. We also have environment light, which is more of an ambient light, a light that's spread out through the environment. So this just gives a greater kind of luminescence to the object as a whole, whilst keeping shadows to a minimum. Scrolling down. Here we have images, and this includes backdrops. We have a city backdrop, we have a desert backdrop, table backdrops, and a gallery. Beneath this, we also have a range of abstract backgrounds, just in case you didn't want anything realistic, and you just wanted something subtle to place your object upon. Obviously, some are overpowering, like the checkers and the dots, but well, it's really up to you which you choose to present your object depending upon the topic. So that covers the overview of Dimension. We're now going to put it to practical use. So let's explore the interface of Adobe Dimension. Towards the left here we have the tools. Next we have the assets displayed. In the middle we have what we call the canvas. This is the plane in which we place the 3D objects upon. To the right hand side, 
we have various options, including scene, action, and properties. And these will change according to the objects that we select. So let's jump in and analyze the first, which is the select tool. I'm going to drag an object over into the canvas just so I can demonstrate each tool better. So with the laptop placed onto the canvas, I'm going to show you the select tool first. Now you'll see I'm clicking upon this object and it's tret as a whole. So I can select and move it on the canvas like so. Now next is the magic wand tool. Now what the magic wand tool does is allows me to select each individual component of an object. Assuming it's a fairly complex object that consists of more than one component. So selecting the magic wand tool, you see if I click here on the object, beneath scene on the right hand side, it shows that I've selected the glass. These are basically the layers of the object. Next, if I select here, you'll see that keyboard is now selected. Likewise, if I select here, you'll see that trackpad frame is selected. Now, with that ability, if I can select each individual component, I can also assign different rules to each component, such as lighting and different images. I could, for example, assign an image to the screen, and I could assign an image to the trackpad, if for whatever reason I wanted to do that. And this is true of many of the objects in the starter assets here on the left-hand side. We can sometimes select each individual component to manipulate it. So, next we have the sampler tool. And what this is, it allows you to sample the conditions of another object to match an object. So let's pull over a twist jar here. And let's zoom in. Now you'll see that this laptop is made out of a metallic kind of texture. Now with this jar selected, if I select the sampler tool, I can now click the laptop and match that metallic texture so that the jar also is metallic. So I've sampled the texture of this laptop and now I've matched it with the jar. So let's move on to the next, which is the Orbit tool. The Orbit tool is basically a free camera. That's to say that we can just click and drag to achieve any angle we so wish. We can drag the camera around the back of the laptop, like so. We can go under the ground of the laptop. We can go above the laptop. And naturally, we can render any angle we so wish according to our preferences. Next, we have the pan tool, which is basically very simplistic. We just click and we drag. It goes up, down, left and right, as the icon suggests. Now next we have the dolly tool, and this allows us to go backwards and forwards in the plane, almost as if it's a camera on a dolly, like so, or a camera that's zooming in and out. So that's all that allows us to do is to go backwards and forwards here. Next, we have the horizon tool. This essentially allows us to look to the right and to the left across the horizon. We can't go in and out, only up and down and left and right. Next, we have the zoom tool. And clicking in, you'll see this increases the size of the canvas. Holding Alt and clicking zooms out and this achieves exactly the same as this drop down here at the top view 100 percent 200 percent zoom in so we're achieving exactly the same but we have it in a tool format on the left hand side there finally we have 
the hand tool. Clicking that, if we move this, it simply moves the canvas within the window. It doesn't affect the content of the canvas itself, it just moves the canvas window within this dimension window. Okay, finally we have something here at the top which was previously skipped purposefully until the end. Now if you click this plus symbol here, we're presented with an array of options. We have starter assets, CC libraries, import your content, Adobe stock, and browse substance source. Now starter assets is what we already see here. This is what comes default with the software, the range of objects, the textures, and the backgrounds, etc. Now, if I click this, I'm going to go to CC Libraries. Now, this gives me access to my Creative Cloud library, what I've built up, the images that I've collected over time and used in my projects. Next is Import Your Content. If I click upon this, I get a sub-menu. Now we have 3D model. You can import your own 3D model. You can import an image to use as a background. You can import an image as a source of light. You can place material upon a selection. So this is your own texture here. And you can place a graphic on a model, which is a pretty basic function that we're gonna cover later. So looking at the next option, we have Adobe Stock. Clicking into this, we have a range of categories that we can choose from to select additional objects to use within the software. Here you'll see we'll have free collection at the top. Clicking into this, you'll see we have a range of additional objects that we can select. Playing cards, french fries, ladybug, tape measure, you name it. You might not have a use for these in logo design visualization, but it's quite possible, so it's worth taking a look through the free selection. As you'll see, in Adobe Stock there was also other categories, including business collection, interior design, electronics, vintage, packaging, and abstract. So, packaging above all is something that will come in handy for logo design visualization. So you can browse through these. Now, not all of these are going to be free, so it's up to you to search to see what is free, what isn't. Adobe Stock is on a subscription basis for a lot of the premium images. So it's worth taking a look around to see what you can acquire for free and what's going to cost. So clicking in, under that plus icon again, we have Browse Substance Source at the bottom. Now, Substance is a complex 3D program separate from Dimension, which Adobe has just acquired. It's a very in-depth piece of software that deals in 3D. But nonetheless, the textures that it utilizes within the software is exactly the same as the textures which are utilized for Adobe Dimension. And so this might serve to be a valuable source, assuming that you need textures for whatever reason. So this is worth browsing around. Again, Substance is separate from the Creative Suite. So it is a separate subscription. So you might wanna browse around to see how much things may cost should you require them. So that covers the tools on the left-hand side of the interface, including those options we've just explored to download and apply additional content. So focusing on the right-hand side of the screen here, where we have Scene, Actions, and Properties. If I select the object on the canvas, you'll see that the scene kind of opens up and shows every component of that object, which we touched upon earlier. Now, if I was to select each one, it reflects on the canvas. So as I select trackpad, you'll see that the trackpad is highlighted, the laptop body is highlighted there, the screen frame. And you'll see I can hide these elements by clicking on the eye. 
Let's go to the keyboard. I'll click the I, and you'll see that the keyboard is now hidden. I can also lock the keyboard down from movement by clicking on the padlock on and off. If I click on the arrow to the right hand side, you'll see that I have the keyboard material. So from here I can edit the material that's been assigned to this part here, which is the keyboard. Clicking back, I can do exactly the same for each one of these elements. So this scene part is just a quicker way to select each and every component and to edit without actually having a work on the canvas itself. Most importantly from the scene panel, as mentioned, we can hide and lock the elements. So with the object selected again, you'll see that beneath actions, we have delete. This obviously deletes the object. Undoing that with the object selected again, you'll see that the next option is duplicate. Clicking upon that, you'll see that I can pull a duplicate out. So I now have two laptops there. Next, we have a folder icon, which is actually the group option. And this comes into effect if the objects are ungrouped. Now, this occurs if we go to object ungroup, like so. And we can move each item independently here, as you'll see. Now, to ensure that everything's moved as a single unit, we'd group those objects. So assuming that they are ungrouped, we drag over everything like so, and we click group. So now, when we move the object, it moves as a single unit. So now bringing attention to these arrows here on the actual model, you'll see that we have the Y axis pointing upwards, denoted by this little diagram down here. We have the Z axis or the Z axis, which runs along here, and we have the X axis, which runs along here. So I can drag this arrow to bring the laptop across the X axis like so. I can grab this arrow to bring the laptop down the Z or the Z axis like so. And I can also use this arrow pointing upwards to bring it up the Y axis. This is taking it off the ground as you'll see. If the model is off the ground, we can use this option here in the actions and it's called move to ground. So clicking this, you'll see that the object is brought back down to the ground. So obviously this is useful if you want to have the laptop looking like it's sitting on a table rather than hovering above a table. When the magic wand tool is selected and we select one of the components of the object, you'll see that we have two extra options beneath actions here. And it's place graphic on the model, as discussed earlier, and we also have select material. So if we click place graphic on model, we can select the file from our computer to overlay an image on that particular component. Here you'll see the screen selected. So if I was to select an image, obviously I'd have my image displayed upon the screen. So let's go ahead and do exactly that. And you'll see the pencil appear there on the screen. And I can adjust the size of that to suit. So this is how I would present, perhaps present, the logo to the client on a laptop amongst other objects. So using the magic wand tool once again, I'm going to select the body of the laptop. And as mentioned, we have an option here, which is select material. Now this comes into effect if there's a material applied to the actual object. So let's apply this wood, cedar, and apply it to the body of the laptop here. With that done, I can now select this part of the laptop and I can go into materials and you'll see it says cedar wood and I can adjust all properties relating to this cedar wood here. You'll see I have the colour there, I can adjust the colour, make it darker if I so wish, and I can adjust the opacity, the roughness, how metallic it looks, and also the glow. There's also translucent options here as well, which I can play around with by moving the sliders. 
So basically that option allows me to fine tune the appearance of the material. So next we have pivot options beneath properties. We have center, top center and bottom center. Currently it's defaulted on center, which means if I was to rotate this object, it would rotate on this pivot here. Whether I adjusted it laterally or up and down, it's going to spin with this as the central point, the pivot. Now I can change that to top center. So there we have it up top center here. Or I can have it at bottom center. So the pivot is down the bottom here like so. So that's the pivot options. Now beneath that we have position options. Now these are the coordinates. This is to be very specific to place your object in a specific place right on the canvas. Usually people will just reach for the tools and place it as the C fit. But if you wanted to be very precise, you could enter your coordinates here. For example, I'm going to put 10 centimeters here. You see it moves off to the right just a little bit. Um, rotation, let's put 20 degrees and you'll see this move around its pivot point on the rotation. You see it's eaten into the floor here a bit. So that's the options for position and rotation. There's also size options. I'll just bring this back to zero so it comes out through the floor. Also size options. Let's bring this up to 70, for example. Now you'll see on the Y, the X axis, it's going to grow off to the side here, like so. So you can adjust the size. Obviously, you can lock down proportions also by clicking on the lock. And this will ensure that for each value that you adjust, the others are adjusted in ratio. So that covers the right hand side of the screen where we have scene actions and properties. Okay, if we look up top here towards top right above the canvas window, we'll see we have a range of options relating to the camera. The first is zoom to fit selection. If I click upon this, you'll see that the object is now expanded to the size of the canvas window. The next is camera undo. If I click this, it's going to return back to its original state because it's undone that previous action. The next one is camera redo. Obviously, if I click this, it's going to bring it back to the size of that window because it's redone that action. Now, the next option is particularly useful. It's camera bookmarks. This allows you to save a range of camera angles. Say if you touch upon a camera angle that you really favor and you use it often to render, you can save an extensive list of different camera angles of the same object or different objects if you so wish. So let's go ahead and do exactly that. To add a camera angle, we click the plus icon at bottom right and it defaults at view. This one's called view one because it's the first. So I'm going to settle for that. So this camera angle is now called view one. Now if I use the orbit tool and turn this to the side and I go back to camera bookmarks and I click that plus again, here you have view two. So this camera angle is called view two. I'm going to press return. I'm happy with that. So let's use the orbit tool again and rotate this till it's facing the back. And we'll go back to camera bookmarks and we'll click that plus again and we'll call this view three. Now we have the list of view one, view two, and view three. That's three different camera angles. Now you'll see if I click back on view two, here we have that camera angle which I saved from the side and view one which marks the original camera angle. So you can make as many camera bookmarks as you wish to save your favorite camera angles for your renders. Finally, we have a preview mode option here up at the right hand side. If you click upon this, you'll see that we have a very rough idea of what this object might look like when it's rendered. Here you'll see we have highlight in the wood. The wood's taken on a more real effect. The keyboard looks a bit more photorealistic and you'll see we have certain shines to metallic parts next to the trackpad here, the buttons. 
and around the edges. So this feature gives you an idea of how the final image might look without having to commit to the weight of the actual render. So that marks those options up there top right. The camera bookmarks in particular is a very useful feature and you might find yourself using that quite frequently. So it's worth acquainting yourself with that. With camera bookmarks mastered, you'll be able to streamline your work to a much greater degree. So now we're going to experiment with some objects and I'm going to be placing the logo upon each. So I'm going to take each object and drag each one individually over into the canvas here. Now the canvas window has been increased in size slightly just so you can see it better. So I went to view zoom in. Here you'll see I can zoom out and zoom back in here. So the first object which I'm going to try is the stack of business cards. So selecting that and dragging it over into the canvas like so. I'm now going to go to the right hand side beneath actions. I'm going to click place graphic on model. So clicking upon that I'm going to locate my file. And I'm going to click open. And here you'll see the graphic is now overlaid on top of those business cards. So clicking at the top point of the circle here, I can reduce this in size, and drag it down, and I'm going to adjust it horizontally, and do the same again, and there we have the graphic upon the business card. Now you'll also see that it's replicated on the stack, so this is the benefit and feature of this particular model. When we place the image on this card here, it's replicated onto the cards at the back. So it gives a sense of the same card being stacked. As you'll see, I've just used a logo here. You might want to consider developing an actual business card file, image rather, which has, you know, text you might wish to consider developing an actual image which represents a business card with text and similar images. You might wish to develop you might wish to develop an image which looks like an actual business card with text. It's really up to you and it depends upon what you want your client to visualize. Naturally, business cards usually have textual information on there, so it's something worth considering. So once this is done, I can now click Render at the top left of the window. With that done, on the right hand side of the screen, you'll see we have a range of options. We have Export File Name, which is pretty self-explanatory. I'm going to type in BizCard here, so that the file is named BizCard. Beneath quality, we have high, low, and medium options. Low is fast at rendering, but obviously it's a lower quality. And high is a higher quality, but it's slower to render. Export formats, we have PSD and PNG options. Now, the PSD format, which is Photoshop, is for people who wish to conduct post-production on the image. That's to say, people who want to modify the image, perhaps give it additional lighting or something along those lines. And it's the PSD file which allows users to do that because the parts of the image are still intact and each can be edited. With the PNG image, however, it represents the final image and it's the image we choose, the format we choose, if we wish no further post-production to be conducted on the image. So in my case, I want the final image to be rendered from the software, and I'm not going to make any modifications, and so I'm going to check PNG and uncheck PSD. Now it's important that the export format is selected before you save, because if you save first, and try and change the export format, it won't export that particular format. So, clicking save to, or beneath save to on the path, I'm going to save to desktop, so I'm going to click open with desktop selected, 
and I'm going to go ahead and click render. So rendering can take some time, perhaps 8 to 10 minutes at a guess. So you do have to be patient. You'll see that the image currently is pixelated or at least there's a load of dots, scattered dots. These dots will be brought together eventually into a crisp, near photorealistic image. To speed things up for the sake of the video, this is increased by 40 times the natural speed. And with the render complete, we can minimize the software. Here you'll see we have the BizCard file, and they represent the high quality version of the business card stack. So now I'm going to choose to render a t-shirt with a logo upon it. So scrolling down, finding the t-shirt, dragging it across to the canvas and placing it down. Using the dolly tool, I'm just going to pull it outwards. And with the orbit tool, I'm just going to move this around like so. And I'm now ready to place my logo upon this. So beneath actions on the right hand side, I'm going to place the image here. Locating my image on the computer, I'm going to click open. And you'll see the image is placed upon the t-shirt. So clicking upon that with the select tool, I'm just going to adjust the size. I'm going to bring it in vertically and I'm going to use the horizontal handle at the side there too. I'm also going to click this dot at the top to rotate. So clicking and moving around like so. And I'm now ready to render this t-shirt. So, at the top left, I'm going to click Render. I'm going to ensure that High is selected as before. I'm going to call this T-shirt. Is the file name. And beneath Export Format, I'm going to ensure that PNG is selected. With that done, I can click Render. And the T-shirt will begin to render. As before, it starts off as a load of dots, but those dots are brought together into a nice crisp image after the render time has elapsed. So increasing the speed of this process by 70 just for the sake of this video. So the render complete, the file does actually save automatically. So provided that you've stated an export file name and the path is correct where you want to save it, you'll have the file at that destination ready to be viewed. So let's minimize the software. And here we have the file here, double clicking, and here we have the final high resolution outputted version of the t-shirt with the logo applied. So now I've decided I'm going to render a drawstring bag. So selecting that object from the left hand side here and dragging it over to the canvas, you'll see the object is now placed. Clicking upon the object and dragging it, I can reposition it. With the Orbit tool, I can obviously select any angle I so wish. But I'm going to emphasize vision on the front here. Like that. With the Magic Wand tool, I'm going to select the front of this object. And it gives me the option to place an image in the actions here. So, clicking upon that, I'm going to select Pencil once again. And you'll see that this graphic is now placed upon the front of the bag. So I'm going to adjust that using the select tool. Just bring it down vertically here. And positioning this. You'll see how the graphic follows the curves and creases of the bag. Which is a bonus to this particular object. Makes it look more realistic obviously. So with that done, I'm just going to tilt this ever so slightly by clicking the dot up above the circle which gives me the rotate function. With that done I'm now ready to render this. So at the top left I'm going to click render and with a file name set as drawstring bag and the quality set to high, the export format set to PNG and the save to as my desktop destination I can now click render. So now the computer is obviously going to render this image of the drawstring bag. 
with the logo placed upon it. So speeding this process up by 40 times the regular speed just for the sake of the video. And with the image rendered we can now minimize the software and we'll see we have the auto save file here in high res crystal clarity. The drawstring bag with the logo applied. So far we've been placing objects onto the bare canvas. So let's go about and place an object onto an actual background image this time around. So scrolling down to the background images that we get as default, I'm going to select this table here. So now you'll see we have this plane and the plane is overlapped over on top of this table. Now it's not at the right angle just yet, but we will make adjustments so that it looks like the object is sitting on this table here. So to select an object, I think I'm going to select the gift bag. This may or may not be appropriate to your application, but let's just say it's a retail store we're designing a logo for. So I'm going to drag across this gift bag and I'm going to position it so that it looks like it's sitting on the table. If I use the orbit tool, I can take a closer look. And using the mouse wheel just to go in and out, this replicates the dolly tool, like so. And that looks as if it's sitting on the table nicely. So I'm going to go ahead and use the magic wand tool. I'm going to select the front of the bag. With that selected, you'll see beneath actions, my place graphic on the model option appears. So I'm going to select that and I'm going to select my file, the trusted pencil once again. And that's going to be overlaid on top of the front of the bag here. So making those adjustments as before on the vertical and the horizontal. We now have the completed gift bag upon a photo realistic table. Now I do want you to see this in all its glory, so I'm going to go ahead and render this. I'm going to call this gift bag. And with quality set to high, which is also slow, and format set to PNG, because I wish to make no changes in Photoshop. I don't require the PSD. So the PNG will do me, and I'm going to save to desktop. With all that in place, I'm going to click render and the computer will now render this gift bag upon the photorealistic background. Again, speeding the rendering process up to 40 times the speed, just for the sake of this example. So with the render complete, I can minimize the software, go into the desktop, and I can open up the autosave file to reveal the perfect version of the gift bag upon a background. So now let's try a different background with a different object. So scrolling down, I'm going to select a different background here. And the one I'm going to select is this table here. So as you'll see, it looks like there's a chair pulled up to a table. And we'll place the object at the forefront here. Now we aren't limited to these images here. We can naturally download additional images. Some are offered for free, whilst others are offered a cost. So let's select an object. The object I'm going to select this time is a basic cube box. So this could be basically for anything you could imagine. Anything could be inside of this box, any type of product. So let's drag this across. And there we have the box upon the table. And it looks as if it's actually on the table there, which is a, that's a good job. So next I'm going to use the magic wand tool. And I'm going to select this portion of the box. And upon that, I'm going to place the image by going to Actions, Place Graphic on Model. And I'm going to select my file once again. Clicking Open. And here you'll see my graphic is placed upon the box. Now I have the option actually place on this surface or this surface here. I'm going to choose the surface on the right hand side. I'm just going to adjust this vertically and horizontally, like so. 
Naturally, I could place additional graphics on this surface here and even the top. So those represent the options, Just, but for now I'm just going to put it on the right hand side as you see here and I'm going to go ahead with the render to show you the output. So clicking render up at top left, I'm going to rename this box for the file name. Quality kept it high, which is slow. Export format, I want PNG, so I don't wish to do any work in Photoshop. Save to desktop and I can click render. So the computer will now render this object and we're going to speed things up once again to 40 times the rendering speed. And with the object rendered, we can minimize the software to see our auto save file on the desktop here. I'm going to double click that. And here we have the perfect version of the rendered box upon the table. It's quite common to show the client a collection of objects within the same image. So I'm going to go ahead and show you how to put together a collection. So let's scroll down and select a background first of all. I'm going to select something abstract and simple. So I'm going to use this horizontal gradient here. It's like a pink which fades down to a blue. This allows the focus to remain upon the actual objects rather than the background. So let's select the first object. And the first object I'm going to select is a tablet. So I'm going to select the tablet and drag it over into the canvas here. Now, you'll see that the tablet is standing up, which looks a bit odd. So what I want to do is I want to lay the tablet down. So to do this, I'm going to click upon this pink ring here. If I move over this line in this circle, you see the ring appears. So I'm going to click that and I'm going to lay the pad down until it reaches the plane. Like so. With that done, I'm going to go to Actions, and I'm going to click this icon here, which is Move to Ground. And you'll see it moves it down to the ground so that it's flat with the plane. So, with that done, I'm just going to use the Orbit tool to get a different view here. Like so. Now next, I'm going to select an iPhone. So selecting the iPhone and dragging it over to the canvas. Now you'll see this is also standing up. So what I want to do is I want to lay this down also. I'm just going to adjust the camera angle again with the orbit tool, just so I can see if it's lying down properly. So again, with the select tool, I'm going to use this pink ring here. And I'm going to move the mouse to the right to lay it down. And again, just to make sure that that's parallel with the floor and flat with the floor, I'm going to go to Actions and I'm going to click Move to Ground again. And you'll see it was raised ever so slightly there. So next, I'm going to select the Business Card Stack because I feel this is going to work well with these two devices. So here we go, the Business Cards. And I'm going to place this over here. So zooming in. I can use the dolly tool to zoom in. Or I can use my mouse scroll wheel. I'm actually going to have the business cards over here. And with the magic wand tool, I'm going to select this business card at the front. And remember, it also replicates the same image for the stack at the back. So all you need to do is focus on this card here. So beneath Actions, I'm going to click Place Graphic Upon Model. And I'm going to select my graphic. And the graphic will be placed upon this card at the front. And it's also replicated on the stack at the back. So just adjusting the angle here using this dot at the top of the circle and the vertical and horizontal adjust like so and there we have the logo applied to the business cards now let's use the orbit tool 
just to get a better angle again. And using the pan tool, just to bring it across like that. Now, the magic wand tool, I'm going to select the screen of the iPad. Beneath actions, I'm going to go to place graphic on model. I'm going to select my trusted pencil once again. And the pencil will be placed upon the screen. So, rotating again using this dot at the top of the circle. And using these handles just to bring it in to the size of the screen. Now, using the magic wand tool on the iPhone, clicking the screen, going to actions, place graphic on model once again, selecting my pencil, clicking open, and doing exactly the same again on the iPhone screen. I can actually zoom in if I wish. So I was using the mouse scroll wheel here and the pan tool. The pan tool allows me to move around like so. So adjusting the size of this so that it fits the iPhone screen. I'm happy with that. So zooming out. I can now position these so that they're flush with each other. So if I use the grid as a guide, you'll see that I've brought the iPad down to this line here. And I'm going to bring down the iPhone. Bring it around here, give it a bit space in between each. And the business cards, I think those can remain as they are roughly, just adjust them ever so slightly so that the front card meets that grid. And there we have it. So, now I'm going to use the pan tool to move the objects into the center and I'm going to zoom in with the scroll wheel here. Alternatively, I can use the dolly tool. I'm now ready to render this collection of three objects. So I'm going to render a top left. I'm going to name this collection. Quality is set to high. And I'm going to select PNG, uncheck PSD because I don't wish to work with it in Photoshop. And the destination is my desktop. And I'm now ready to click render. So speeding up this process 50 times the natural speed just for the sake of this video presentation. And with that collection rendered, we can go to desktop, the save location, and we can open the file to reveal the crystal clear collection of images comprising iPad, iPhone, and business cards. So if we scroll down, we'll see the array of options we have for lighting. Now, these are defaults which we can select. Say if I selected Studio Low Key, I'm given a different kind of lighting setup, but not only that, I can also go to Scene on the right-hand side and I can click into each one of these lights to make subtle changes using sliders. Here you'll see on the environment light, I have beneath properties, intensity. So I can increase the intensity of this light if I want to do. And you'll see this reflect on the canvas. Also rotation, I can rotate the light. And you'll see that also manipulates the image on the canvas here as the light rotates around. Now, as mentioned previously, we can use the preview function so we don't have to commit to a render. We can get a good idea of how the render might look by using this preview. As crude as it is, it does give a fair idea. You can see the screen here, we've got some shapes that are lost. This shape in particular here isn't visible because the light has too much intensity. Therefore, if we're seeing something like this, we would decrease the intensity or choose different lighting altogether, depending upon our preference. So you'll see as I decrease this intensity, that shape now becomes clear on the screen here, as it does on the iPhone and the business card. 
So it's definitely worth using this preview function as you adjust the settings for each light or indeed if you change each light. If I move on to Studio Light Arch, I'm not sure what that says, it's actually cut off there. You'll see that the same is also happening. We have an overbearing light upon each one of these. And again, this shape here is lost. So what we do is we'll go to properties and we'll turn down the intensity of this until that shape is visible or until everything on the screen that you are presenting is visible. So we can go through each one of these. Each one has a different quality. Go to studio color. This kind of gives a color tinge to the lighting, almost as if it has a filter over each light. So again, we can go to environment light. We can adjust the intensity and the rotation of that light. You'll see it has a, an effect on the canvas there. So besides that, we also have the sun. This is a sun setting. Um, I do believe this is a light that's kind of fixed on the ceiling which spreads it in its entirety rather than pinpointing like a spotlight. So let's go ahead and play around with the properties of this using the intensity slider. Here you'll see that I'm increasing the intensity of the so-called sun here. Again, rotation, we can rotate the sun and it has this effect upon the canvas. Now one important feature here is actually colour. If we check colour, it allows us to use this box to select a colour of lighting. So, if I click this box and select red, here you'll see we have a red tinge to the canvas now. There's now a red filter figuratively placed over the light. And you can do this for each and every light that you select. For as long as colour is checked, we can use this box here to select a colour. Cloudiness, we can make this a little bit dull if we so wish, to give the impression of clouds as the name suggests. Now, moving these back towards the centre, I'm now going to show the key light. I'll select another light to demonstrate this. Studio Woodwind. And I'll move on to key light. Now beneath key light, we have intensity, rotation, height. We have a shape, we have aspect ratio, corner ra radius, size and edge softness. So rather than go into technical detail of each, I'll just adjust each and you can see what kind of effect it has on the object on the canvas. So again, intensity, this is self-explanatory, that's the intensity of the light. Rotation, we've covered that, that's the position in the circle where the light rotates. Height, this adjusts the height. I imagine the 90 degrees is going to be more bright in comparison to minus 90 degrees, which is right. Shape, it's giving a square light at the moment. We can also use a circle. This might become more prominent as the light gets closer. We might actually see the shape of the so-called beam. I've actually found little documentation relating to the aspect ratio feature here. And I can't see anything apparent that changes when I do adjust this. So that's something I'll have to skip over for now. Size is the size of the light itself and it has that effect. Very subtle. Edge softness. This dampens or sharpens the edges from the cast light. And again, we have the same kind of properties, intensity, rotation, height, and we have all those options below. Shape, aspect ratio, corner ratio, size, edge softness. And we have a backlight finally. And again, we have those options for the backlight. We have the intensity, we have the rotation, we have the height, aspect ratio, size, square, and edge softness. So that covers the lighting. I have provided a range of renders, which shows you the renders in their default state with all the properties as default. Just in case you wanted a reference source to see what your renders might look like, what your renders might look like when complete. Obviously, the objects are going to differ. You might choose different objects from an iPad, an iPhone, and business cards, but it could give a fair idea and give you a base of judgment for what setting you might choose here on the left. 
and then you can perhaps go on to adjust later on if you want to make tweaks of your own. So that covers the general features of the lighting in Adobe Dimension. So wrapping up, I hope this video has proven useful to allow you to develop mockups for yourself or for your clients.